Hello and welcome to the second annual Touchdown Middle East 2024 in the heart of Bahrain. I'm now joined by Lex Kors, President of the European Data Center Association and Chief Data Center Technology and Engineering Officer at Digital Realty. Um, Lex, pleasure speaking to you. Um, we were reconnecting pleasure. last night saying you were one of my first interviews ever when I joined the industry as a journalist, as a young journalist, <laughs> and I had my trousers completely ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> not by me, eh? No, not by you. Okay, not by you no, 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 that's clear about these And actually the world changed a lot since then, so we do have to put those things out there. <laughs> Uh, but uh, look, it's a pleasure seeing you in Bahrain. Also, a surprise to see you in Bahrain because Digital Realty hasn't really done much in Bahrain. So I think we'll talk more from an EU DCA perspective as opposed to Digital Realty. Um, when you look into the Middle East or the Gulf region, you can tell me which one you want to focus more. What do you think are the, the attractive points of this region to international foreign players uh, to come and, and, and play their part here? So I, I think there is an opportunity. Um, as, the, as I said, as the president of the EU, of the EU DCA, uh, we have been going around uh, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, talking to governments, and uh, one of the questions I'm asking them is, what do you want mm -hmm. with your region? Because, you know, we, we can drop data centers on your surface, we can use your cheap energy to run them, but it's not, li it's not endless, mm -hmm. because if I throw three gigawatts of data centers in that region, you will not have the energy. You will have the energy in the ground as liquid gas, but you will not have it, let's say, as available on the grid. So that will definitely be a hurdle. So cheap energy is relative as well. So if it is now costing me even 10 cents on, on, a, on, a, on a kilowatt hour, still, over time, if you don't have it, you need to upgrade your grid. You need to bring it from somewhere. Then. The real question is, what do you want with your country? And it's interesting because there was not much thought about this because they simply say, this is the data center industry, let's go for it. But you know, we build these communities of interest. If you look at, for instance, the issues with desalination plants, you see this red uh, um, uh, plants in the uh, in, in fungus, basically, in the, in the seas. We can, we can do something together, and that was basically a start-off for me to say, hey, let's treat the Middle East as a start-up, have the conversation, plan it, talk about it as an industry, a data center industry representative, and go from there. Hmm, interesting. I think also one point that's coming up this year a lot is that, of course, governments are doing a lot to push for investment, both yeah. in, in-house or in Middle East, yeah. but also foreign investment. But for the first time ever, some people have been saying that it is a bit siloed in the sense that each nation pulls for their own part of the stake. There isn't really a cross-region um, push in terms of regulation. Um, what's your view on the regulatory side of the Middle East and how does it compare to other regions, mainly I guess Europe? Yeah, so for the moment there is not much regulation, which is also a scary thing. Because when, when they put it in, then it can go yes, the other way. Yes, and, and, and on top of that, um, there is so many changes every time you hear. So it's better that they step back, hmm. really think this through, speak to advisors, speak to people who really understand what happened over the past in Europe, in US, in Asia, and then let's say come up with a set of workable uh, regulations hmm. that may actually benefit both the industry, hmm. but also let's say the country and the whole region. Hmm. And uh, one of the things that is interesting, because you mentioned there is a siloed approach in the Gulf, um, I think that if the Gulf states would work together, we would not have to implement six or seven different sets of regulations, uh, border by border. That doesn't help us at all. Mm. And they could unlock so much more. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think before diving into cultural change, uh, differences as well, what would you say from a technology perspective, for a standpoint, because that's, that's your playground, technology, engineering, um, and without wanting to go into the PUE <laughs> discussion, no, 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 no. Um, but from a technology standpoint, what do you think are the major consideration points that you need to have to build a, a gigawatt data center in the Middle East, because I'm sure it's not a blueprint you can copy and paste uh, well, from a climate like Europe or a climate in the US. So for me, now looking through the eyes of my company, I would say there is a definite concern about the overcapacity that's currently uh, under construction here. 
if we think about Gen AI, two and a half years old, maybe three, if we think about the, how the, the chip capacity evolved from 60 kilowatts per rack to 150 kilowatts per rack to already talking about 500, 800 kilowatt per rack, mm. and then on top of that, 72 GPUs in one rack act as one, then you can connect them all together to 300 megawatt acting as one computer. So I think that's a real important thing. If you see too much overcapacity, that means there is no enough demand. And with this fast changing uh, um, densities at this moment, mm. you may have the wrong design. Because your design from now may not match, uh, if it is empty, the demand in two and a half years from now. So we're not talking about eight years, ten years anymore. No, we're talking about very short timelines. So I think that is really key. Think about this. You may have to design empty space. Yeah, so be ready. So uh, modular, uh, scalable, and, and adaptable. Hmm. So I think these things are really important as well in your design now. And then there is opportunity, but the scary thing is the overcapacity I, I see and hear. Mm. Okay. I guess another point of conversation that we have a lot, especially in Europe, is the, the heat reuse yes. and technologies around that. I mean, data centers in the deserts, for lack of better wording, it's not a new thing. We've, we've seen Nevada, uh, we see Texas as well, which is yep. very hot, but they do have cold nights. Um, how, how does that work in a place like the Middle East? What, what happens to the heat here? I mean, it does, it does get a bit cold in some parts, yeah. but what, what happens to the, to the heat? So, I've been thinking about this because, you know, as you are involved in heat reuse in Europe, you start to think about heat reuse in general. And rather than using the heat as it is today, um, you may use the heat from the outside, which may go up, if you do it well, up to 50, 60 Celsius in certain regions. Now, you only have to boost it up to 80, 90 mm. to actually get cooling out of it again by, by uh, um, system. So this is something you need to look things upside down. Mm. Don't think about, oh, it's heat, I need to cool it down. You may want to boost it up and then, uh, let's say, create cooling out of it again. Mm. Absorption cooling, for instance, is one of the technologies okay, used for this. Okay, I think let's talk about uh, plans. So we, first I can ask about digital realty very quickly. Does digital realty have any plans to come into the region, any investments around no, here? Not, not that I'm aware of, mm. you know. So I'm, I'm involved in, in new designs, R&D, government relations, sustainability. Yeah. Well, if you're not aware, I think, So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm basically not aware. Yeah. I would say it's, it's a good opportunity to look at, you know. Because as I said, if you treat it as, as, a, as, a, as a startup, if you have the connections with the governments, if you want to plan it, I think there's an opportunity for digital because we're one of the biggest players in the world to actually drive good behavior mm. rather than just dropping all of these data centers uh, somewhere. Mm. Mm. But then also, I think it's also very interesting that the president of the UDCA is attending an event in Bahrain. I mean, what brings the president of the UDCA to Bahrain, yeah. the uh, European Data Center Association. What's, what's the correlation? Yeah. So it, it, actually I was asked by Stein Grover, who is the, uh, representing the Dutch Data Center Association, mm. and he mentioned he said, Lex, um, um, like to go to Qatar. Um, I see, let's say, an opportunity to, uh, to have conversations with, with government relations. And he said, and you as the president of the EU DCA, I would mm. really like to have you with me because you have the overall perspective. So see it as the overall Gulf state opportunity. <laughs> he said, I have the land uh, vision so I can do a state or multiple states, you know, state by state. And I think that is important. So when we spoke, let's say, also to the representatives of the government in Qatar, um, it, it became clear that these conversations were actually uh, in time and they were very useful um, because they also like to grow the digital economy. Mm. Um, one of the things we did wrong in Europe and uh, US, we spoke about building data centers. Instead of talking about we're building the digital economy. Something never happened since Team Age. Mm. So I think those kind of things are important. 
Um, I think it, it, it's an opportunity for the for the Middle East. There is a large le- uh, piece of land and a large of GDP behind the Gulf states. If you think about Iraq, Iran, uh, Saudi, there's so much that that can be served uh, on this digital economy and society. By the way, the way we communicate, the way we we do these things together. Um, I think that that's uh, that's why I actually. Uh, I came over. Mm. And then even even to produce language models as well, um, AI is going to be able to save some of the the, the less spoken language uh, languages in the region, um, yeah. and not just even in Africa. We talk about the Swali um, artificial intelligence language language model, for example, earlier today. Um, and then I guess because this is not your first time in the Middle East as well, but for people watching that have never been to the Middle East, what would you say are some of the main cultural differences? Because doing business here is not the same as doing business in Europe, doing business in the US. There's a bit more formality with things, but from your view, what's What's the biggest cultural I, I, I think I think it, it starts with understanding the Middle East. So, for instance, we are typically the type of, of people who would come into the room and want to go straight to business. Um, I know from my old days, I, I visit already uh, Yambu and, and Jeddah, uh, in, uh, not Jeddah obviously, but uh, Riyadh. Um, at in um, the 80s and the first thing you learn just sit down and listen sit down and listen and I think that is so important because the the key really important things of life family relation connection conversation we left these things behind you know we may do it at home well if you if you're lucky um, but but that's I think the, the the key starting point. So we were at Qatar, and uh, the representative of the of the government, he realized that we were Western people. So he would introduce himself and said, "I will speak, and it will take about 15 minutes." At least give it time. <laughs> no, but also it, it's both ways. Mm. So, but I think if you come here. You need to adapt, let's say, to uh, to the to the culture. Um, you can do your business, but I think um, there is so much to 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 learn as well from this region. There's mm. such a rich culture. Yeah, which us as the, in the West sometimes don't appreciate and don't understand until you visit uh, and actually see so much is happening on all fronts, um, including renewable energy, for example, which is yeah. which is a big surprise. Um, and then, so if you look into next year, into 2025, what's your wish or what do you expect to happen in the region that's going to really push forward yeah. that is in the development? So I think, I think again, you said data center development. Mm. I call it building the digital economy again. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's, I think what is key, 2025, that we hope that we brought a kind of first message that um, the governments will start thinking about what do I want with the region hmm. so that when we grow with the, with, by the use of data centers to support the digital economy, that we do this in a way that we have thought about capacity hmm. in 10 years from now not only the coming two years and I have the capacity, that we thought about the sustainability around the region, including, let's say, these desalination plants with the red algin that is happening around us, that we think about how can we harvest heat, how can we reuse it rather than just blow it wherever we want it. And um, how do we maintain a certain amount of biodiversity and how can we avoid that we create microclimates in a way that it will impact other regions. I think that that's something I really hope and that we will bring forward with these kind of conversations. Hopefully. And then uh, you've recently also launched a new book, The Seventh Wave. Um, to talk, talk us through that and talk us what, what The Seventh Wave is. So. Um, yes, so I was I got inspired um, by uh, Professor Jeffrey Lichtman, and he is a professor at Harvard, and he was talking about uh, brain mapping, and so he he mapped a mouse, and uh, he could see, for instance, if you think about the amount of data that would go in is from Amsterdam to London, human brain is around the world that much data can put mm-hmm. be put in a head. 
then I, I looked at uh, Holt Lipson, and he has defined the sixth wave of, uh, of artificial intelligence. We're now at the fourth. Fifth is robotics, simple. And the sixth is sentient AI. Sentient AI will represent, uh, let's say, <coughs> AI that is conscious. Um, I personally see that as a big issue. And I know that humanity is always ambushed by its own success. And I give you the example, roughly 200 years ago, we started the steam age, real big industrialization, and we brought Mother Earth to her knees in 200 years. So, you know, think about Gen AI, in two and a half years, it took us, no, let's change it, it took us five million years to get where we are today. It took Gen AI two and a half years, three years, mm. to get equal with us. So in five years from now, theoretically, if AI teaches AI, it will be 10 million years ahead of us. Mm. So I thought, with that knowledge that we know how the brain will start working, I think it's better that we implement, consider, let's first say the same with this. Let's see if we can avoid sentient AI. But if we can't, if we see it happening, it's better that we implement biochips. So now we keep our own ethics. Ethics are, are uh, designed by your way through life. Your parents may have the same ethics, but the interpretation of those same ethics are slightly different. Mm. And so you, who will have the same ethics as your parents, they will be slightly different again. And so ethics are unique per person. Buying billions of units of ethics, US ethics, Chinese ethics, for even European ethics, if they would happen, would not be the right thing in my head. So I believe implement clean, ethic-free um, bio chips. Mm. Let's raise human level to 2.0 and then have this conscious grow of the same ethics into these bio chips and then uh, go from there. But that's as I said, only if we know that, and I believe sentient AI will happen, and, and I don't see that as a, as a good thing. I call it the seventh wave, we are AI, yeah. W-A-I, we are AI, yes. Yeah. And I was going to ask, so where can people read the book? They can find it on your LinkedIn? So it's, it's on LinkedIn, and if you see the introduction, is actually meant uh, to have conversations at university level, uh, to talk to uh, governments. Uh, for, for instance, I've just planned a meeting with European representative. Yeah. Um, I think these conversations are important. Whether or not it happens, let us be prepared this time and yeah. not being ambushed. But the conversation, like you said, conversations are important and that's what drives us forward. Absolutely. Um, and the seventh wave definitely is going to come sooner or later. It will come. Yes. It might not be in that shape, might be a different shape, but it will come. Yes. So might as well be prepared. Uh, but Lex Kors, President of the European Data Science Association and Chief Data Science Technology and Engineering Officer at uh, Digital Realty. Thank you so much for talking to me. It's always a pleasure. Thank um, you. As for your home, thank you for watching and do check our website and social media for the latest digital infrastructure news from across the globe. At the Tech Capital, you lead, we report. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.